Adam Schefter is a candidate to replace Adrian Wojnarowski as ESPN's top NBA insider, and he would keep his job doing the same for the NFL. We have the details except for when he would sleep. Plus, the college landscape continues to reshape, and we're chatting with an NBA agent on the impacts of the new CBA, media deal, and Woj's retirement. It's Wednesday, October 2nd. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, we're talking with our tuned-in columnist, Mike McCarthy, who had the scoop on Schefter possibly replacing Woj. Our reporter, Amanda Christovich, has the latest on realignment, and we're joined by NBA agent Mark Bartlestein, whose job has undergone radical changes due to recent developments in the NBA. First, here are your top headlines. We begin with the loss of another legend. On the same day that Dikembe Mutombo died of brain cancer, MLB's all-time hit king, Pete Rose, passed at 83 years old. Rose is one of baseball's most beloved but controversial figures thanks to his prowess on the baseball diamond and his practice of gambling on his own games. Rose was banned by MLB in 1989, forcing him to step down as manager of the Reds. The Hall of Fame declared him ineligible two years later. With legalization of sports gambling in 38 U.S. states, some have taken a second look at Rose, but even in the modern state of betting, betting on your own sport, never mind your own games, is out of the question. FOS Today sends our condolences to the Rose family and baseball community. Meanwhile, in the NFL, Raiders wide receiver Devontae Adams requested a trade on Tuesday, just one week after head coach Antonio Pierce called out his team's effort and some players who made, quote, business decisions in their brutal loss to the Carolina Panthers. Adams was acquired by the Raiders ahead of the 2022 season when college teammate Derek Carr was still playing quarterback. When the Raiders moved on from Carr ahead of last season, there was natural speculation that Adams could be next. Until yesterday, the Raiders had remained steadfast about hanging on to Adams, but now will reportedly consider trading the star wide receiver. To make matters more awkward, a social media account associated with Raiders head coach Antonio Pierce liked to post wondering whether Adams had played his last down with the team. This team is a mess, and we'll keep an eye on this one. Sticking with the NFL, Jared Goff set a record on Monday night, going 18 for 18 on his pass attempts against the Seahawks, and caught a touchdown pass on one of the niftier trick plays you'll see as the Lions took care of business at home. Detroit head coach Dan Campbell had two game balls to give out afterwards, and neither of them went to Goff. Campbell told reporters after the game, I just gave the game ball to somebody else, so I feel awful. I did not realize he was perfect. I did not know he was literally 18 for 18, but I knew he played really well. Last year, we saw Giannis Antetokounmpo stalk the Pacers' locker room as they held the game ball after his career-high performance, but Goff is taking a much more even-keeled stance, telling reporters, that's okay, we'll see. Maybe Campbell will make it up, but that's okay, I'm just happy we got the win. That's a good team first answer, and I suspect he'll get the makeup call next week. Michael Jordan has pledged a million dollars towards Hurricane Helene relief efforts alongside 2311 Racing. In a statement posted to social media, Jordan said, Our hearts go out to everyone suffering from Hurricane Helene's devastation. 2311 Racing and I are honored to support the NC Disaster Relief Fund and Second Harvest of Metrolina as they help rebuild lives, restore hope, and ensure that those affected receive the assistance they need. While the process of recovery will take a long time, as a proud North Carolinian, I know firsthand the strength and resilience of the people in the state we call home, and we will get through this together. Western North Carolina was hit especially hard by the storm, with some mountain communities still unable to receive help due to roads that were entirely washed away. You can help out by donating to Samaritan's Purse or the North Carolina Disaster Relief Fund. We flip over to college sports, where we've already had a few notable updates this week. The Mountain West is is continuing efforts to bolster its member schools. Yesterday, the University of Texas at El Paso announced that they had accepted a formal invitation to join the conference. UTEP will leave Conference USA for the Mountain West starting in the academic year of 2026. And the Mountain West isn't alone in conference realignment updates. Sacramento State's Pac-12 committee raised $35 million in just 24 hours in an attempt to land an invite to the Pac-12. The SAC-12 committee announced a goal of $50 million total to go toward NIL funds and was able to get well over halfway to their goal in one day by sourcing money from local businesses, community leaders, and the local tribe. And finally, Gonzaga is officially joining the Pac-12. The Zags announced that they have accepted an invite to officially join the conference in all sports starting in 2026. We'll have more on that in a bit with reporter Amanda Christovich. Our own Mike McCarthy is reporting that Adam Schefter could replace Adrian Wojnarowski as ESPN's NBA insider. He would also keep his role as the network's NFL insider. How would that work? What would that mean for the rest of ESPN? Is this a good idea? Mike McCarthy has the answers, and he joins us next. Joined now by front office sports tuned in columnist, Mike McCarthy. Welcome, Mike. Great to be here, Owen. Uh, Great to have you. So you're reporting that 
Adam Schefter could replace Adrian Wojnarowski while retaining his current job. So we have the NFL insider being also the NBA insider. Yes. How would this work? It's the biggest Woj bomb since Woj announced his retirement. Uh, we exclusively reported that Adam Schefter is a candidate to succeed Adrian Wojnarowski. And the way it's been explained to me, Owen, is fascinating, is the job could and would entail him doing both jobs. So in a sense, he's been described to me as the ultimate insider. He would be covering the NFL and the NBA, which happen to be ESPN's two most important properties. With you on all that, I just I keep coming back to, I mean, when Woj retired, the sentiment was, you know, first of all, what a guy, unique figure, but also, man, it's exhausting being Woj, like good for him, like going off into what would maybe be a more relaxing job as GM. Um how is someone going to have that job? I mean, would Schefter have the full Woj job or is he sort of more like the face of whatever this thing is? That's really the $69,000 question. Could anybody, any human being, even Superman Schefter, do those two jobs? Uh, look, here's what we know about uh, Adam. He, lo he loves to break news and he loves to work on the biggest properties. He's a huge NBA fan. So would he be uh, open to something like this? I think he would be. You know, would it be a huge challenge given you know, his time constraints right now from covering the NFL and the fact that ESPN has its first two Super Bowls coming up? Definitely. So, uh, I mean, there's going to be a lot of levels to this, but it's it's really a delicious possibility that I think has got a lot of people thinking. And it shows to me, uh, Owen, how the old – Guard guardrails and barriers are breaking down. You know, the old days where somebody had to be exclusive to one thing or only work for one network it doesn't work like that. Mike Greenberg is doing the NFL now. He used to do the NBA. Schefter could do the same thing. Yeah, I mean, I do wonder. The ESPN seems to be going for a pretty top-heavy strategy. I mean, you know, they're they're still the biggest name out there in sports media. Uh, with, you know, huge number of employees, huge number of names and faces. But it, I feel like they're just consolidating into Stephen A., McAfee, Greeny, yeah. you know, Schefter, arguably, and, you know, Woj before he retired. Um, does, does that, do you feel like that's accurate? And I just feel like it's not like they don't have a bench here. Like, why not elevate one of those people? Yeah, I think that's a very accurate statement, Owen. I think you've really got your finger on it. It's a deliberate strategy. Burke Magnus is paying an elite, small list of people a ton of money. And he wants to use these big personalities as much as possible. And that's where you possibly get a Schefter doing the NBA. That's where you get a Stephen A. joining Monday Night Countdown. That's where you have Greeny doing everything from the NFL draft to NBA Countdown to now Sunday NFL Countdown. You take these big personalities who drive the needle and you use them as much as possible and as many places as possible. And that's the strategy. The big name we haven't mentioned yet is Shams Tarania. Yeah. Uh, I'm still thinking at the end of the day, uh, we were going to hear a lot of names and maybe, uh, you know, Schefter will do some, have some NBA scoops here and there, but does Shams just find his way to ESPN at some point? Yeah, lock and load. I mean, he is obviously the most uh, ready-made solution. I mean, just put him in the microwave in 30 seconds, he's ready to go. Question is, does ESPN want to pay him what Shams wants? I mean, Shams has been on the low end of the pay scale for years, you know, because he's been working for multiple companies and he hasn't really gotten the bag. And now you've got Amazon Prime Video coming in and NBC coming in. And they would both love a young 30-year-old telegenic NBA reporter to be a huge part of their NBA coverage. So I really think that you're looking at a three-way battle there between ESPN and those two new rights partners. And don't forget, ESPN has a deep enough bench with Ramona Shelburne and Mark J. Spears and Brian Winhurst that they just say, you know what? We're not going to replace anybody. We're just going to do closer by committee. Yeah, I mean... That I know we live in a world where no one's allowed to ever take a step back at any moment, even when you're, you know, your unique Hall of Fame reporter retires very unexpectedly. Uh, but it, in a in a different world, I would be saying, shouldn't we just and maybe in this world, too, I'm saying Woj didn't just like, you know, snap his fingers one day and say, you know, I'm going to be this seminal figure in media he sort of became this person over time um, and, you know, is now the model for it. I don't know if you can just recreate that guy by hiring anyone other than Shams and I guess Schefter. I'm wondering if they don't just say, yeah, like 
go all of those people you just mentioned we could throw in bobby marks yeah. go try to be the next woge and yeah maybe we'll we'll have this four-headed monster who um you know is is equal to or more than you know whoever gets shams well given their size and their deep bench you know espn doesn't rebuild they reload that's what they used to say about the old yankees and that's the same as espn you know they can just plug in you know players and you would have it but the real question here is Woj is irreplaceable, right? Uh, he was the premier NBA newsbreaker for 20 years. So if you're going to try to replace the irreplaceable, why wouldn't you at least consider doing it with the best insider there's ever been? And that's Adam Schefter. There's no doubt about it. He's, he's the best insider there's ever been on any sport. He's got the most followers. I mean, anybody would pick up his phone call. He could call any NBA coach or GM in the league, and they'd spill their guts to him. So, you know, the, the question is, can Schefter reason, you know, realistically do these two jobs and would they give him, you know what I mean, the the, the pay bump to compensate him for that? I, I think that's also a, a thing here. I mean, you can't just say to Adam Schefter, you know what I mean, you have to work, uh, you know, 900 hours a week. You know, he would have to be uh, compensated. So there's a lot here to watch. I, I think this is literally turning into one of the biggest stories of the year. And we didn't even know about this until two weeks ago when, uh, you know, Woj dropped the bomb. So it's it's been a lot of fun to cover. Yeah, and it will be going forward. Mike McCarthy, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Buster Posey has been the Giants president of baseball operations for one day, and he is already making big changes. Posey said in his introductory press conference that Pete Putila will be replaced as the team's general manager. That hire will tell us a lot about how Posey intends to run the team, but even before he does, the Giants have completely changed identities. Posey's era as a player was defined by a team that made big commitments to solid players, and his unofficial first move as leader of baseball ops, extending Mac Chapman, echoed that philosophy. Previous president, Farhan Zaidi, conversely was known for finding diamonds in the rough and taking huge swings at free agents. He narrowly missed on Bryce Harper and Aaron Judge. The Giants didn't need an identity change as much as other teams, but they got one, and this will be one of the most interesting threads to watch in the MLB offseason. But if you're treating a patient, you want to get the right diagnosis, and Diamondbacks owner Ken Kendrick might want to get a second opinion. He went on the Burns and Gambo show after his team was eliminated and said a number of things, including that he was at fault for signing starter Jordan Montgomery. Kendrick said that he pushed for the team to go get Montgomery, who was still a free agent at the end of spring training. They got him for $25 million this season with a vesting option for next year. Here's Kendrick on that move. If anyone wants to blame anyone for Jordan Montgomery being a Diamondback, you're talking to the guy that should be blamed. Because I brought it to their attention. I pushed for it. They agreed to it. It wasn't in our game plan. You know when he was signed right at the end of spring training. And looking back, in hindsight, a horrible decision. You know, to to have invested that money in a guy that performed as poorly as he did. That's a crazy thing to say. One, you have to believe in your process, even if the results don't always land, and the process here was fine. Montgomery had been excellent for three straight years, and they got him for a below-market deal. It didn't work out, but part of that, if you look at his peripheral stats, was probably bad luck. But the real reason he shouldn't have said all that is that Montgomery reached his threshold for his vesting option and can opt in to return to the Diamondbacks for $22.5 million. That's exactly the sort of deal a player looking for a bounce back year might want. Generally, don't throw anyone under the bus, but especially someone who might still be on your team. A former employee of the Jacksonville Jaguars who stole $22 million from the team is suing FanDuel for being his enabler. Amit Patel filed a lawsuit against the sports betting giant on Tuesday saying that FanDuel exploited his gambling addiction. His attorney, Matthew Litt, wrote in the suit that Nintz actively and intentionally targeted and preyed on plaintiff with incentives, credits, and gifts to create, nurture, expedite, and or exacerbate his addiction with the only possible outcome that he would ultimately hit rock bottom. And look, if you steal $22 million, you're probably not going to get away with blaming anyone else for what you did. But he's also not wrong about FanDuel leaning into his problematic behavior. You know how casinos will bus out people from cities and give them free drinks and even hotel stays as long as they keep gambling? FanDuel was doing similar stuff. They gave Patel $1.1 million in credits and trips to the 2023 college football playoff championship game, the 2021 and 22 Masters, and Formula One's Miami Grand Prix, according to the filing. You only do that if you're confident that the client is going to gamble away everything you're giving them and more. 
Over to a more productive investment, Charles Barkley has not committed to a future as an NBA analyst, but in the meantime, he is developing his own media empire. Sir Charles Round Mound Media received a fresh round of funding from Redbird IMI, which is helmed by Jeff Zucker, a former executive at Turner, where Barkley still works. Full disclosure, Redbird IMI is also an investor in front office sports. Round Mound Media will relaunch as a joint company with Everwonder, another Redbird IMI-backed media project. Barkley and probably Turner will be a very visible presence in the venture. The company already has 10 projects in the works, including a Barkley documentary and a series of basketball documentaries narrated by Barkley. There will also be collaborations with TNT Sports, which will have first dibs on any of the sports-related projects. Didn't Barkley say he was retiring like three months ago? That turned out not to be true. As we covered in the headlines, it's the wild, wild west when it comes to college realignment. Both the Pac-12 and Mountain West are scrambling to maintain FBS status while also being mindful of their identities and media values. My colleague Amanda Kristovich is on top of all of that, and she joins us next. Joined now by a front office sports reporter, Amanda Kristovich. Welcome, Amanda. Hey, how's it going? Great. Great to have you on. So since the Pac-12 poached five teams from the Mountain West, that has set off this latest conference realignment scramble. Uh, so we've got some news there. Uh, Gonzaga is going to the Pac-12. This does not count toward them retaining their status as a power football conference. So what's the Pac-12 up to here? Yes. So um, we had two pieces of news today. Uh, the Pac-12, as you mentioned, and also UTEP to the Mountain West, which I'll get, let's, we'll get to that in a second. Um, so what the Pac-12 is trying to do here with Gonzaga, as you said, not only are they not an FBS football school, they don't have football at all. Um, so adding Gonzaga is a move that is going to be good for beefing up Olympic sports. You know, some that they were concerned might be falling short. It's going to be good for the media rights value. It's going to be good specifically, obviously, not just for, you know, the quality of men's and women's basketball in the league, uh, but it's also going to be, you know, a moneymaker, right? Because we all know that you can make millions off of how far you advance in the men's tournament. And soon now a little bit less than that, but some for the women's tournament. So that's also going to hopefully generate money so long as Gonzaga doesn't all of a sudden become like the worst basketball team ever. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to not make a joke about Georgetown. Um, so anyway, um, that's what they're doing. Um, they still need one full FBS football playing member in order to maintain their FBS status under NCA rules. So Pac-12 is not done yet expanding. Um, they are not a power conference. They are not going to be a power conference, most likely, but they do have a chance of remaining an FBS conference. Okay, got it. And what would they have to do to become a power conference, remain a power conference? Yeah, there are a couple things. Well, I mean, really the power conference status has kind of been stripped from them already because it, it, it kind of relates to two things. The first is the autonomy voting status in the NCA governance structure. So the power five conferences each had like extra, you know, power and voting ability in the NCA's governance structure that was stripped from the PAC 12 um, several months ago. Um, so they no longer have that. And then the other thing, which a little is a little more subjective, is the amount of uh, revenue distribution you receive from the college football playoff, whether classified as a power conference or a group of five conference. That distribution system is going to change in a couple of years. So now it's kind of more like um, Big Ten and SEC and then everyone else instead of power five and a uh, group of five. But, you know, if the Pac-12 is able to get a you know, sort of status in as a conference in the CFP in the future at all, which like currently it's not even signed on to that contract just because like they didn't know what the fate of the league was. It's not like they were trying to like shun them or anything like they could theoretically sign on to that future contract. Um, but yeah, they're they're not going to be getting uh, anywhere close to the amount of money that uh, the current, let's say, power four conferences are going to be getting. Gotcha. And let's hop over to. Uh, UTEP signs with the Mountain West. Um, yes. Where does this leave the Mountain West as, you know, it's attempting to retain its stature? Yeah. So si somewhat similarly, um, so the Mountain West needed two more full FBS members. Um, they now need one. 
as they signed UTEP, which is going to join them in, uh, who is going to join them in 2026. Um, you know, there have been a lot of rumors flying around about, you know, Texas State or, you know, there are some FBS or FCS programs and FCS programs need two years to transition to FBS if they get approved by the NCAA. Um, so they're within the two year grace period window. You know, they could count, um, you know, essentially the Mountain West has until 2028 to fill this last slot. Uh, because the grace period doesn't start for them until 2026 because they don't lose those other five schools till 2026. So like there's enough time to turn an FCS program into an FBS program, but I'm not sure that like they necessarily really want to go through the headache of that. Um, So we'll have to see, but they, you know, they're having lots of different conversations, trying to figure out what is going to be the best fit for them. What's going to help them with, you know, negotiating their next media rates deal Um, you know, and then also like what is going to be, you know, a school that might help put them ahead of the PAC 12, if that's possible. Interesting. Um, you know, which I'm I'm sure they're all the more motivated to do that now. Uh, Sacramento state is also waving around some money and saying, pick me, pick me to the PAC 12. Um, (laughs) how, how do you see the, um, the, you know, and it seems inevitable, right. That both of these schools will conferences will find at least one more school to mm-hmm. to come in um how are they kind of shaping themselves toward you know to kind of redefine themselves into the, this next era i mean i think right now they're just in survival mode right um but i also think that they're you know if if you think back all the way back to last week right which seems like two years ago now um there were conversations that the Pac-12 was having with the with four AAC schools that were spread out throughout the country. So there was this conversation of like, okay, are we going to create another sort of like transnational conference? I mean, uh, clearly that didn't work out for, you know, the reasons that the schools ended up not thinking the offer was good enough to leave the AAC. But like, ultimately, if we're being realistic, unless you're getting a billion dollars a year in a media deal, like the Big Ten is, do you have anywhere near close to the money to be a transnational conference? I mean, like, yeah, it helps bump up your value a little bit, but is it going to be enough to be, you know, sending players all over the country in multiple different sports? I don't think so. So I like weirdly to answer your question about the future, I think like the Pac-12 and Mountain West are just sort of looking at almost doing the opposite of what the power conferences were doing, which is like staying regional, keeping the costs low, trying to like keep this brand identity of like similar types of schools in a similar region and, you know, keeping that uh, or at least using that to keep them alive for the next six or seven years. Yeah. And after that, we'll we'll see what happens next. Amanda Christopher. After that, who knows? (laughs) Exactly. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thank you. We all have two ages, our true age and our biological age. Our bio age suggests how healthy or unhealthy we are inside. You want your bio age years younger than your true age. Let me tell you how Field of Greens is helping me do that. Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. Each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com, fieldofgreens.com. It's a very interesting time to be an NBA agent. Salaries are rising every year, but the league is trying to tamp down the biggest spending teams. Meanwhile, players have bigger personal platforms than ever before. I spoke to agent Mark Bartlestein about how his job is changing and what goes on behind the scenes as players try to shape their careers. Here's our conversation. I'm joined now by Mark Bartlestein, founder and CEO of Priority Sports and Entertainment. Welcome, Mark. Good to see you. Yeah, absolutely. Great to have you on. So um, NBA 
not a whole lot going on. Pretty much, you know, smooth sailing for you. Yeah. Uh, I joke. The NBA, let's start with the new CBA. So this is meant to rein in uh, spending, among other changes, rein in spending at the top levels. Is this already affecting your negotiations? Uh, I think it just it affects the overall business. I think it's there's no question it's had a huge impact on spending, certainly at, with the higher end teams. Um, a lot of those teams that are that have that have been successful, um, you know, there's been constraints put on them now in terms of adding to their team. And so when you take a certain segment of the of the marketplace away, you know, there's a, there's a trickle down effect to everybody. So um, there's no question. There's it, we it's the this is the first summer of it. I think people will, uh, you know, they'll they'll react to it and they will analyze it, evaluate it, and and people we always find a way to come back out on the other end. But there's no question there was an impact this summer. One thing that's I've been wondering about with all this is, you know, obviously a while back we saw LeBron and Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh all team up in Miami. Uh, we pretty regularly will see players, you know, like Dame Lillard a year or two ago saying. I want to trade and I want to go to the heat or James Harden, uh, you know, trying to control his destiny as much as possible. I wonder if this new CBA is going to make it harder for players to do that uh, because they can say, you know, I want to go to the Clippers. I want to go to the maps, whoever, but they, that team might not have the cap space for them. And of course the cap was always there, but now things are a little bit more constrained. I wonder if this is sort of a welcome side effect for the NBA. Yeah. I, I don't know that it will change players from, uh, selecting maybe where they want to go, it's going to make it far more difficult for those teams to be able to, to get those players and in some cases make it impossible, you know, because the constraints that have been put in, you know, there's there's so many mechanisms to acquire players, um, not just through free agency, but trades, sign and trades, different ways to go about it, sometimes buyouts. A lot of those mechanisms and tools have been taken away from teams that are in that first and second apron. And so because of that, um, you know, I think it, 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 it's, there's no question it is, it's put some limitations uh, on some things that we have seen in the past. But again, I think there will be, there's a lot of strategic planning that's going on right now so that teams will have that flexibility going forward. And I think that's a, you know, that's what we saw this past weekend, you know, in the Minnesota, New York trade. I think a lot of that trade was driven by Minnesota's, uh, they, they want to have the flexibility to, you know, to construct their team in a certain way going forward. And the amount of the salary reduction that came from that trade is going to give them some flexibility going forward. You know, the, those moments when a player, you know, publicly says, I want out and I want to go over there, even if they don't say I want to go over there. Um, I, I imagine that's just a percentage, probably a small percentage of the times a player wants out and, you know, tells their agent um, and maybe even tells their agent, I want to go to, you know, one of these three teams. Uh, how common is that for players to, you know, try to, to direct their, their destiny, um, just doing it more quietly than some other cases. Well, I was just before, before we got on today, I was on, on the call with, with a team and I, I kind of joked that I probably got about an hour, hour and a half first day of practices today. I probably got about an hour and a half till I get a dozen calls saying, get me out of here. You know, so it's, I mean, listen, it is, um, it's a difficult business. People don't realize, you know, the, the, there's there's such pressure. Uh, there's such a small window for players to realize their dreams and to create, um, you know, to take full advantage of the economic opportunities that are out there. They can't do this forever. So every moment is precious. Um, and so because of the, and, and my job is to make sure I'm putting my guys in a position where they can lead their best life and reach their fullest potential and build a career of their dreams. And so it's, it's a constant analysis that goes on every day. You know, teams are in the business of trying to win at the highest level. Players absolutely want to win at the highest level, but they also want to build a long, sustained career. And so trying to find the right balance for all that is that's what keeps me up at night, you know, quite often. Yeah. And, and when a player does want to move and also just, you know, it doesn't have to be they want to leave their current team. Maybe they're a free agent uh, or just for whatever reason, looking toward their next step. Is usually their top priority getting a, a starting job or a job where they can show their talents? Or, you know, how is that balanced against, you know, location and playing for a contender? Um, what's usually the top priority? I mean, in a perfect world, you want all of it, right? You want to be in a city you love. You want to play all the minutes you can take and you want to win a championship. You know, it's hard to find all those things. 
you know, I think that the number one thing for players, first and foremost, is, you know, they, they love playing the game. They love playing and they love competing. So they want to be in a situation where they can get, they, they can reach their fullest potential as players. And that's always number one. And then you layer on top of that, you know, obviously a place where you're going to enjoy living and great fan base, a great city, um, and a chance to really win. So you, you want all of it. And that's where we're always striving to find, you know, the best of all those different elements. But, you know, make no mistake about it, you know, playing is first and foremost for every player and not just playing, but but playing um, where you can you can reach, you know, you, you, you have to have realistic expectations about who you are in this league and what your role is and, and what's going to allow you to have a successful career. But within those parameters, uh, getting full advantage of everything you possibly can. Of course, we have a new media deal kicking in next year, so it's not here yet. The the cap increases we're going to see from this not have not quite yet arrived. Obviously, teams are already planning around this. Um, are you already seeing the impacts of this deal that has not quite reached the, the league? I think in terms of the impact, um, there's a lot of planning that's going on right now, right? So, you know, planning for those cap increases that are coming, how that's going to affect salaries, how that's going to affect the various exceptions that are used uh, for, for contracts, the amount of cap room teams are going to have. So all that has to go into the equation right now when you're making decisions, you know, about, you know, a possible extension for a player at this time, or just, or just game planning out how you see, see, see things coming down over the next few years. And do you think the new media deal, I and mean, certainly it's going to change the quantity of, or, you know, the, the size of contracts. Uh, do you think it will change things qualitatively as well in some way? Well, I think it's going to be fascinating. Obviously, there's going to be a lot more that's going to be done streaming-wise. Um, and I think there's great competition in the media space to present you know, the best product for the fans. And we're seeing constant innovation, which is, I think, really exciting for fans and the way they can watch the games, the way they can interact um, you know, during the game. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I think it's going to be... I think we're just in such a transcendent time in, you know, in the world and certainly in sports and just the way we're consuming everything. And certainly the NBA, I think, is at the forefront of that. I'm wondering if there will be a period where players are looking for shorter deals, at least if they you know, feel like they're in a, a moment to bet on themselves. For instance, you've got Zach Eady, who's coming into the league. Uh, you know, maybe he has a breakout season and maybe he doesn't want to commit long term because that cap is going to go up every year for a long time. Do you think we, we might see players leaning that way for a little bit? You know, that's always been kind of uh, the yin and the yang of negotiations forever. So everything's relative, you know, even though we're having these big increases now, we nowhere in the world has there been inflation like there has been in sports. It's, there's always been these big cap increases and salaries have, have risen accordingly. And so you always have that decision to make, you know, do you want that long-term security or do you want to be able to capture the upside of where salaries are going as your as your value continues to grow? And so that's that's such an independent decision for for each player, for each athlete. Um, something we talk about at length in any deal that we do. Uh, the contract length is a huge topic. Um, it's from the from the team standpoint and from our standpoint. And then you ultimately are trying to find something that works for everyone. But from a player's perspective, no question that. You have to balance the, the security that a long-term deal brings you with the possibility that with where salaries are going, um, you might miss some real upside going out into the future. But that's a that's a personal decision. On on where salaries are going, we're already seeing annual salaries approaching sixty million uh, per year. Um, how and that's before the media deal kicks in. How big are these salaries going to get? Well, they're going to keep growing. <laughs> they're going to grow. Going to grow at a large rate. I mean, we're going to we're going to see cap increases, you know, in the NBA probably ten percent a year, um, you know, for the next, you know, at least next probably three or four years. Um, so you 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 know you play that out, and the, those max salaries and the exceptions and cap room are all going to increase by that ten percent number. So um, you know, I don't think there's there's any end in sight, which is the way it's kind of been in professional sports for quite a long time. Recently, of course, we had the retirement of Adrian Wojnarowski, and usually, you know, the retirement of a journalist is not not something you would think of as impacting the league itself. But Woj was such a singular figure. Um, what what does it mean, you know, on your end, especially because he was he was the deal breaker, him and Shams, um, to have that figure no longer part of the league? You know, Woj, uh, one of one. You know, that's I would say that first and foremost. I mean, his his work ethic. He was just relentless. 
Um, he he just he literally I don't think he ever slept. Um, and so yeah, I, I'm I'm sorry to see him leave the business because I I really enjoyed working with him. Um, but you know I also consider him a good friend, and um, he's so happy right now. I just talked to him actually yesterday, and he's he's happy like he's he's in his sweet spot, which is you know St. Bonaventure. Um, and so he's gonna he's so passionate about building up that program. So th listen, there will be a void. There's no question. I don't think anyone's gonna really replace what he did. Uh, it was it was just the news breaking, but he had a he had an aura about himself and a you know his own personality. You know the Woj bombs and everything that came with it. So that that's a that's a loss for the fan base of the NBA. But um, but for him, like he's in a really good place. He's happy and and there will there you know with the way media works, there will be individuals that will step up and they will create their own kind of aura and their own personality and and they'll find a way to to generate that same type of interest. I'm sure. Did you get any sense just talking to him from, you know, bittersweetness, leaving this life behind, or is he, he's ready to say goodbye? Uh, you know, like I said, I talked to him yesterday and I think he's, he's in a really, he's really happy. You know, he's happy. I mean, he's, this, this is, you know, I think it's one thing if you walk away, you're not sure what you're going to do, but he, he walked away into something that, you know, as passionate as he was about the NBA, um, he's more passionate about St. Bonaventure. So I think he's in a good place. We, we live in this, I mean, this is not news exactly, but um, I feel like the, the player brand, the, I feel like player brands are now bigger than team brands. And, you know, that it's just kind of a fact of life right now. It also kind of matters for, you know, players' ability to make money and, and even their ability to, you know, have a life beyond the NBA. Um, how does that affect how you do business to, you know, see these players kind of build up their celebrity that transcends their team and to some degree, even their sport. Yeah, we, I mean, it's, it affects us in every way. So like, you know, we have a really proud, we have an amazing marketing department. Um, they do such creative, interesting, innovative things. And um, the opportunities for us to do those things are just, they're enhanced in so many ways now, because we talk about this all the time, you know, every athlete, every celebrity, every influencer, every individual for that matter, you know, has their own channels, you know, they have their own ways to present themselves and to uh, market themselves and ultimately create advertising for themselves, you know, through all the channels that are out there, you know, whether it be Instagram or TikTok or Twitter, or whatever, you know, whatever X is it is now. Um, so it, the, the, um, the ability to connect with your fans, the ability to create the messaging that you want to create, um, it's, 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 we're in a completely different world. It's only going to get bigger and better. And so, yeah, there's the opportunities are endless right now. And it's something we work on every day. Very interesting stuff. Mark Bartlestein, really appreciate you joining us in the show. My pleasure. Enjoyed uh, being on here. And you guys do great work and very really much enjoy your publications for sure. Time now for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell has not been coy about his desire for an 18-game season and more international games. Now he's saying that those two changes will likely go together. Goodell said on the NFL Network's Good Morning Football, quote, I think we'll end up going to 16 games at some point in time, referring to international games. Quote, the owners have already authorized us to go to eight, but I'm confident, particularly if we're going to do the restructuring of the season, that we would get to 16 at some point. That's going to be very exhausting for players, but the NFL is relentless in its pursuit of expansion. They are never content, and I'd be surprised if Goodell doesn't get his entire wish list before too long. That's it for today. Subscribe wherever you like to tune in and throw us a comment if you're on YouTube or always interested in your feedback. Thanks for listening. I'll see you tomorrow.